My name is Dr. Grace Karam Stevenson, and this is the intro lecture for 1826, graduate course in comparative higher education at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Education, the Ontario Institute for Studies of Education. Welcome. I love this course. This course draws together students from across OISE, and we're all fascinated by this question of the values and the culture that underlies higher education. Now, I did not design this course. It was designed in the 1980s by Dr. Ruth Hayhoe. And I was fortunate to take this course from her about 15 years ago in my own master's. And when I took this course, I found that my ideas about higher education, my understanding of the university just exploded out of the box. If you had asked me before I took this course, what was the university? Define it. I would have said the university is a great time of formation. I would have said it takes adolescents and turns them into adults. I might have said that um, students can learn skills that help them to contribute to society. And I would have said that the subjects are anything from English to politics to biology, maybe engineering. I also might have mentioned that there are these research projects professors work on in mysterious laboratories or dark offices somewhere. I think they cure cancer. Um, and I would have said that universities are run by professors and administrators and governments should fund them. And for the most part, um, I used to believe that universities were values neutral. They didn't have any connection to ideology or religion. Um, those would have been my answers before I took this course. But what I did not know is that each of these features of the university, who the students are, who runs it, the relationship to power, these look totally different in different times and places. Last month, I had the chance to travel to Winnipeg, Manitoba, a large city in central Canada. And I went to the Human Rights Museum there, which is an incredible place. Now, when you visit the museum, you actually move through the exhibits in a circle, moving higher and higher through the building until you reach the Tower of Hope. And then you can climb this beautiful glass tower, which helps you to find some peace after the hearing about the very intense human rights atrocities that we've committed as a human people over the last millions of years. I really recommend this, this museum, it was amazing. And one of the displays on the lower level gives examples from known history going back thousands of years and it lists different philosophers, educators and leaders. You'll see in this picture references to Zoroaster, to Hammurabi's Cove, to Ahimsa from the Hindu tradition and the philosophies of the Maori people in New Zealand. And as I looked at this great wall describing every community, every civilization, big and small, going back thousands of years, um, I realized that every time and culture had groups, groups of people that contemplated the coexistence of how we live peaceably, how do we act kindly and justly? And this was often connected with religion. And in certain places and times, these groups became formalized into institutions, contemplative scholarly institutions. Now, peaceful coexistence was not their only subjects. There was a range of subjects and ideas. But the point that hit home for me so strongly was that all of these communities and civilizations have had higher learning traditions and all of them have looked so different. Now we are just one small point on this beautiful line of great thinkers and scholars going back thousands of years in every time and place in every culture. So if we hopped in our time machine and we went back to 725 BC and we went to China to one of the great Shu Yuans of classical learning, these were academies that were very, very different than our modern day colleges and universities here in Canada. They're not just the next step of compulsory education for students, and they were not just a space to gain skills for the workforce. They were places of philosophy and political debate. They were often administered and financed very separately from the empire, and they were built away from major cities. So they had this monastic feel. This is this idea of separation and contemplation. If we flew over to the Middle East and set our time machine for 1200 CE, we would then find the great Arabic universities of the Middle East, as well as the madrasas of Islam. And these acted as gateways between the East and the West, 
They had great traditions in preserving knowledge, knowledge from India, knowledge from Europe. They took thousands of manuscripts from ancient Greece and elsewhere, and they preserved them in huge libraries. The Islamic universities had very unique subjects, history, music, politics, ethics, metaphysics, medicine, astronomy, chemistry. There was no psychology, no law. They were very different than the medieval universities that emerged later in Europe. So our last trip in our time machine might be to medieval Europe. Maybe we pick 1600 CE. Another distinct model of the university, the Oxfords and Cambridges of the world. And I've posted um, a video for next week on the founding of these institutions. And in Canada, of course, we have our roots in this university, this medieval European university, which through colonialism spread around the world. And almost all of this higher learning before the, the 1850s was really linked to religion, to these monastic, these monks who devoted their life to contemplating divine or spiritual things. They were often the producers and the caretakers of great knowledge. So when we study higher education now, we too often just look at modern traditions. Yet we can ask key research questions, guiding analytic questions. We can ask them of all of these eras of the past as well. And there are so many great questions we can ask. What's the societal or personal purpose of higher education? Who is running it? Who's funding it? Who are the students? We know that women have been excluded at different times and places. What were the reasons? Why were they let back in? What are the subjects that are studied and why did those come to be important? What types of research, if any, do these institutions produce? What's the relationship to power or religious organizations? And what are the philosophic traditions that really provide the foundation for this, these types of institutions? What's been imposed on different institutions because of colonialism? And I would argue we have to ask the parallel important question to that, what has been retained? What deep culture, cultural roots, cultural values have persisted despite the Western colonial influence? So in this course, we're learning about the forms of higher education in different cultures around the world. And we will learn that researching higher education in certain ways can highlight or overlook certain aspects. Now in this course, I highlight the main divide that we see in the literature between comparative higher education and comparative education. Now it's a small difference, but it, it will really inform your research. Some of you have encountered the second group, the comparative educators, in the SIDEC core class here at OISE. Culture, values, context. These are very embedded in the research that comparative education scholars do. This is a field that goes back 200 years analyzing Europe and really asking, why do the different countries in Europe have very different education systems? And again, within this, context is very important. Understanding holistically all the factors that create a national or regional context. But more recently, those who have studied comparative comparative higher education since the 1950s, people like Burton Clark, Simon Marginson, they often take a political economic lens. They look at how higher education is shaped by changes to government or uh, global economic systems. And if you listen to the next video, Dr. Hayho's uh, origin story of how the course was founded, she begins to explain that after the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the frameworks that they were using to analyze education, capitalist, communist, developed, developing, these seemed hollow. And I agree, it's true. If we only examine political changes, we miss the cultural, religious, linguistic shifts that are interconnected and that are really influencing many of the changes in higher ed. So this week, we are starting the course by asking you to read the article by Shakina Rajendramanai. Shakina is a professor in CTL here at OISE, and she and I collaborated to write this article called The Barrier Between. This is actually uh, using data from my fieldwork collection in uh, Malaysia and Dubai. And in one hand, it's a very classic example of comparative study. I took two countries and I compared them, but the analysis is anything but typical where many comparative education scholars will look at in depth at political or economic structures, I wanted to know about ethnic and linguistic divides. I mentioned earlier that if we look at the role of women in higher ed, there are many times when women are not included in the academy. Well, in present day Malaysia and the UAE, with very diverse populations and rigid categories of belonging, 
It's ethnicity, linguistic, religious, citizenship divides that def decide who is excluded. The colonial powers that shaped higher education um, set things up in such a way that uh, divisions in ethnicity were really highlighted and current modern higher education systems now have adapted and built on those divides to structure who is allowed into certain institutions. And so when students are applying to university, their entire shape, uh, their entire choice is shaped by what's their citizenship, what's their ethnic background, what is their linguistic um, uh, experience. So it's not surprising then that when students get into the classrooms and they're working in groups, these ethnic divides begin to shape the group work and interactions they have in the classroom. The teachers are not doing this formally, but these divides that surface in the classroom are reflecting broader cultural distinctions that are happening outside in the society around them. The students that we looked at were um, attending branch campuses. So the curriculum expectations um, for the sample program were actually being set by British and Australian universities with very little awareness of the rich cultural context in which they were operating. And I should clarify that I'm not doing my analysis without consideration of political economic systems. There are definitely political structures that need to be considered, particularly the historic origins of the systems in which these campuses exist. For example, how the British colonial uh, educators set up the education system um, and the current political policies. But these political economic forces are only a few of the factors that shape education systems and shape the students that move through them. So read this paper, bring your questions to class. What factors does this raise in your own mind about how culture shapes the way that we do education? And consider how you might do a comparative analysis that considers one or two phenomena in a different, in a two different contexts. As you go through this course, you're going to choose a comparative topic. So this could be a higher education issue that you compare in two countries or regions. Or you can do a diachronic comparison where you compare different time periods. So you might consider the religious influence of Air off, religious influence on Arabic universities in 1100 and compare it to the extent that Arabic universities are religious today. Or you might do a comparison of student protest movements in the 1960s in Russia, Argentina, and the US. So it could be diachronic or location based. But as you begin to develop this research question that will guide your analysis in both city settings, consider where you sit in comparative education research. Are you concerned with culture and values, or do you love to think about political economic change? Either one is fine, and you're going to find readings in this class that take both approaches. But I do want you to begin to anchor your framework in some of the required and additional readings from week two. The additional readings from each week act as sort of a curated repository of readings for you. So you don't need to just hit the search engines. Start with the additional readings. Dive into them. Use them for your papers. This is a compressed course and you need help moving quickly through your paper. It's also important for me to see that you've drawn on the frameworks for class to show that your work was designed for this course rather than a product of AI. Particularly in week two, I want you to begin to develop that rationale for your research topic and consider how will you do your comparison and look at those uh, thinkers from week two, the readings. What categories do these scholars use to compare in each location? When they want to compare funding models, what sort of aspects do they look at? You know, volume, um, uh, people who are involved in the funding decisions. What are the categories that you need to begin to develop that will be used in both locations? There are so many uh, ways that these authors select categories, and I want you to begin to think about that already. Now, some of you will be asking, like, do I compare two locations or more? And to be honest, two is fine. Some people want to do more because the research question they developed lends itself to that. Um, some want to do three or four because the research question helps that out. That can also sort of thin out your paper. So two is fine unless you decide yourself that you want to do more, but really help make sure it reflects the research question you're asking. And of course, most importantly, I am here for consultation. Book a one-to-one -one meeting with me and we will chat about the details of your paper. So in this course, we'll practice asking comparative questions about all the different systems we analyze. The second week of the course, we'll consider this comparison between higher education 
or comparative higher education and comparative education. Dr. Hayhoe will join us for the question and answer, so bring all of your questions there. The third week, we will look at ancient traditions of higher learning in five regions, the Chinese, Mayan, Aztec traditions, as well as the Arabic universities, India, and medieval universities. Some of you will have read the medieval university readings in 1803, which is the intro course for the higher ed program. If so, please consider choosing a different reading to dive into for your learning activities. Um, if you have not read anything on the medieval university, though, please make sure you do catch up on that. The fourth and fifth week are looking at modern systems, how the European university was adapted and implemented around the world. And the final week will be choose your own adventure, choose a topic of your choice. You'll be put into thematic groups and each group will prepare a video presentation that will act as a lecture for that theme. And you will choose two of those, not the ones you did a video on, for the content of your learning activity. So from here, I would love you to watch the origins video with Dr. Hayhoe to understand the founding of this course and what changed with the fall of the Berlin Wall in September 11th. Then I would like you to go through all of the small activities that are in the introduction module. I particularly need you to fill out the intro form before the first class so I can organize you into groups. The pre-activities before the first class will take about an hour and a half of your time. And because I'm not running a second section on Thursday, this is considered part of your coursework, your seat hours for this. Thanks so much, and I can't wait to see you in class. Bye.